This Gum Bands podcast is made possible by the Buell Foundation, serving southwestern Pennsylvania since 1927, and by listeners like you. Thank you. So this is a Gum Bands video. We always put out the audio, but we also capture the video, and sometimes we like to share it. This is our talk with Sarah McAlee, the broth monger who makes wonderful soups, and who is also a funeral director in Mount Lebanon. And this is a Gum Bands video. I just realized it's a beautiful day in the oh, neighborhood. Oh, so nice, yeah. I didn't know what, uh, what I was gonna wear, but I just ended up wearing a trench coat, and I, it's not cold out at all. No, it's nice, it's a beautiful blue sky. Yeah. Uh, and yesterday was Mr. Rogers' birthday. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, he would have been 95. Happy birthday. Yeah, wow. happy birthday to Fred. He was young. 90, I, I mean, to me, 95 is like, I mean, it's old. It's, I, it's old enough to die, I say. Like when you're past... Yeah, but he died in his 70s. I know, that's what I mean. It's 20 he was, years since he I'm passed I'm saying away. he was young when he died. Yes. Like yes. past 88 is old enough to die to me. Oh, interesting that you've made that delineation. Yeah. I want to start with your name because how do we say Macaulay? Yeah, that's exactly right. Sarah Macaulay. Yep. Cool. And like, I, I think I knew you for a while before I ever knew your name was Sarah Macaulay because yeah. you are the brothmonger. Right. The brothmonger? At brothmonger. I don't <laughs> um, uh, Most people do call me the brothmonger, which is fine. And, and that's from Seinfeld. You have a picture of the little <laughs> Seinfeld guy. Yes. And, yeah, like the, the soup, soup Nazi. Soup Nazi, yes. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, I met you, I remember, at uh, the Vintage Mixer, the Pittsburgh Vintage Mixer uh, at Nova Place, the old yeah. Allegheny Center Mall, yep. repurposed. Um, I think it was the first time they did the Vintage Mixer there. Yes. And uh, Anthony Badama was making pizza. Mm-hmm. And I think you were like his... I was his like counter girl. I had worked for him at the, at the pizza shop for a while. Um, but at that point, I hadn't been working for him, and he just needed somebody to do the counter. So he asked me if I could. I think that somebody was supposed to do it and couldn't. He needed someone to fill in. He asked me if I was available, and then I was there. Well, anytime I have an opportunity to get Vidamo's pizza, I oh, want to yeah. do it. And uh, I think I ordered from you. Mm -hmm. And I was recently out of the hospital, I think, at that point, And I said, can I come sit in that chair yeah. while I wait? Yeah, you sat next to me. And it was really funny because uh, people kept seeing, you were behind the, the table where I was and people kept seeing you and asking to take their pictures with you. And you were like very much like kind of separated from the crowd. But I mean, obviously you were very gracious and took pictures with people. Well, I think, but at some point you said, do you know I make soup? Oh yeah, I, I said, exactly. I make, do you know I make soup? And you were like, I love soup. And then you gave me $12 and came to my house the next day. I don't remember that part, but okay. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's how it was at that time. That you, I picked it up in the, the courtyard or yeah. the yard next to your house. Yep. You had like a gate that you opened up and you went in and uh, it was on the north side. Yep. And uh, it was a great uh, ritual, I thought. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I, I really miss having it like be like that because it was like that for two and a half, three years, but has not been like that uh, since the beginning of 2021. Um, and I miss it a lot, but it's also really nice to have it not at my house anymore. So you're not even cooking it at home? No. At the beginning, you cooked everything at home and you put it out for people to pick up in your yard. Right. Well, at the beginning, it was a very small operation. And up until the time that you had it and then posted about it, I only had maybe 200 followers and probably, I don't know, 10 customers each week. Um, and then it grew to, I, when you posted about it, I got I, like 600 followers. And then um, it, it just blew up. But I never knew that it was, that it was going to happen like that. I never really intended for it to happen like that. Obviously, I'm very happy that it happened like that. But um, yeah, it was a very small operation. So it was very doable to, to do it at my house. Um, and it, it very quickly outgrew my apartment. But I still kept it in my apartment for a very long time. So, and can you, you know, talk about like, why? Like, you know, what was it about soup? And like, was that the entrepreneurial spirit that got you to say, I'm going to make this for other people? Yeah, um, kind of all of that. I, I started, soup has always been a big thing, like with me and my mom. My mom and I are very close. She was pretty much a single mother my whole life. 
um, and she she worked a lot, so there was pretty much always soup of some kind. And I have very distinct memories of like being small and standing next to her while she was like ripping apart chicken and stuff like that. Um, so I didn't ever want to learn how to cook when I was a kid. And then in my early 20s, I was dating a line cook and we lived together and he didn't want to cook at home. And he was like, it's time for you to learn how to cook. So he started teaching me some things and then I made soup and he was like, this is what you're good at. Like, this is actually really good and this you can, you can do this well. So I just always could make soup and kind of taught myself here and there more and more about cooking. And then I just would, I would make soup for my, fr I have like a, a portion issue where I can't make, make food for one or two people. Every time I make something, it's for six or eight people. So I would always have soup and be giving it out to all my friends. Um, and then when I started working at Badamos, I mentioned to Anthony quite a few times that I w was interested in selling soup. And I wanted to sell it at the pizza shop um, and make it for him. And he was like, you know, yeah, I, that's fine. I would do that. But, you know, you should just start doing it. And he was like, you should do it on Instagram. You don't have to worry about, like, getting in trouble because it's probably not going to go crazy. And I was like, okay. But it went crazy. Yeah, but that's what happened. So that, so that's, that's kind of how. And then someone po uh, posted on Facebook, like, I'm really sick. Where do I get soup in Pittsburgh? And that was what kind of... Uh, that was like the, the final straw. I was like, there's no, there's really not anywhere that specializes in it that you can go and get, get good soup. So I made her soup, took it to her at work, and then from that moment it was like, now I'm doing it. Do you remember what kind you made for her? Yeah, it was sausage tortellini. Because that was the soup that I would make for all my friends when they were sick because it's like, it has a lot of red pepper and garlic and kale. So it's like good for you, but also a little spicy and garlicky. So it kind of like kicks your sickness out of you. So I think you're pretty uh, wide ranging in your soups. Yeah, definitely. I mean, is there any soup you don't make? Um, no. I, people ask me for like a menu all the time and people ask me, you know, what I make and I always just say just tell me what you want I can I can make anything you want all right so it starts in your house and you you know put it in your side yard and people pick it up yeah um, and, but then it, it's it goes it grows yeah now I think for I think the first time I remember maybe you were doing it out of Badamo I remember a line I think I drove by thinking like maybe I'll pick up some soup yeah but the line was so long yeah I couldn't even imagine getting in that line. Yeah, that was um, probably about a year into it. I did a pop-up at Badamos. Um, and that was the first time I ever did a pop-up. But that was the only time I ever actually sold soup out of there. Oh, just one time? Yep. Okay, I, I remember seeing that line and yeah. it was scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, and did Anthony mind that? That must have helped his business too. Oh, no. Well, it was actually on a Sunday when he was closed. But Anthony um, has always been very... When he started Bidamos, there wasn't really anybody that he could look to, anybody in the industry that he could ask advice. And um, he kind of was very self-made and has always been, um, you know, really willing to help out people who are trying to break into the, to the industry. He helped out Pigeon. Um, they were Pigeon Bagel. They, they cooked out of Bidamos for years before they started their space. Um, but he... And he and I have always been, um, since, I, since I worked there, he and I have always been very close. So he, he helped me out a lot. But no, he didn't mind at all. He, he was very willing to help me at any opportunity that he could. And I've always been very grateful for him. But then you make, I remember, then you, for a while you were at Mayfly. Yeah. Is that right after Badamo? Is that the next place you go? In March of 2021, I got a cease and desist from the health department because I, I, I was making soup and selling it out of my home. And you are not allowed to do that, especially in Allegheny County. There's no, Allegheny County doesn't really have any easy way to get a, what they call a cottage license where you can actually cook and sell things out of your home. Um, so I got a cease and desist and I had to stop production and then was kind of just waiting for the next opportunity. 
and Anne, the woman who owns Mayfly, uh, got a hold of me and said that her chef was leaving and they had a, a popular soup program so she was looking for somebody to come make soup there and we worked out a deal where I made and sold soup there and kind of ran my business through that through Mayfly. And Mayfly is kind of like I, I always called it like a hipster grocery store. Yeah. In the in the Mexican War Streets. Right. On the north side. Yes. And you're there for a year? Yeah, one year. Okay. And then um with I just in twenty twenty one I was working full time at the funeral home, doing soup full I made soup at Mayfly twice a week. And I was also working out with a trainer three times a week. So I was like, it was just, the amount of work that I was doing in that year was outrageous. Um, and then by December, I had burned myself out so much that I, I couldn't do anything. So I ended up taking, taking off Brothmonger for like three months. And then by that time, it was like, okay, well, you know, we're not doing this anymore. And so Anne and, and then Anne had other people in in Mayfly who, who picked up the soup. So that arrangement just kind of dissolved. And then from then, I've just been <sighs> taking opportunities as they come, um, but haven't really, haven't really had a good home for Brothmonger until now I'm selling out of Time Machine. Time Machine, which is, I, I always call it the luncheonette or the little yeah, sandwich shop right. on Liberty Avenue exactly. in Bloomfield. Yes. It's a separate little stone building, which is really cute. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. And you now cook there and distribute out of there. Right. At first it was pop-ups. Again, a long line. Yeah. Yes. And then I think you went only pre-order. Yeah. So I, which that's been wonderful. I, I did a pop-up with Ryan, who owns Time Machine. Um, called Broth Machine and that it was outrageous. There was 200 people in the line. And um, so we haven't tried that again. <laughs> um, but then I started doing my just solo pop-ups out of there and they were on pre-order, which was really nice. Um, and now Time Machine opened, It's he's a seasonal business. So he opened for the season on Thursday, this past Thursday. And uh, this past weekend was the first weekend where I had soup available to people when they came when they came there. And did it sell out? Yeah. That's what I assume because it yeah. always sells out, right? Yes. Yeah. Luckily, um, it sold out, and then I'll be doing it again this coming weekend. Okay. So, how do you decide what's next? What soup to make next? Yeah. I just I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's good. No. Yeah. It's, so it's it's just like whim. Yeah, it's total whim. Okay. I try to keep it like. You know, I just had a chicken soup, so now I'll do a beef soup. I haven't done a seafood soup in a while, stuff like that. All right. Now, in, in the process of explaining all that, you made one casual reference to uh, at the funeral home. Yeah. <laughs> That's another aspect of your life that yes. I think people find fascinating. You make soup, but you are a funeral director. That's right. And how did that happen? How did I become a funeral director? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, why did you become a funeral director? Well, it's I when, I grew up in a very small town, um, Elk County, Johnsonburg, Pennsylvania, which is uh, two and a half hours north, and I have a very large family. I have fifty first cousins. Um, my mom is one of seven. My dad is one of eight, and uh, from the time I was a, a young child, I people were dying. Uh, because I have a huge family. Um, so I just kind of always had a more realistic view about death and I, I kind of noticed that it really negatively affected people, um, you know, like people who are left behind. And my family specifically, before I was born, my mom, one of my mom's brothers died in a motorcycle accident. And when I was growing up, my mom had a really hard time talking about him, so I never really knew anything about him. Um, and then we had, when I was like 12, my cousin died in a dirt bike accident. So we just had a lot of kind of like tragic experiences with death when I was growing up. And uh, I was saying, uh, I just noticed that it, it really tore people up and I, thought that it didn't have to be that way and there's this sense of uh, avoidance and um, you know vagueness around death and people don't really think about it or talk about it until it happens and then they don't know how to deal with it and it just you know they're torn up about it 
So I thought, you know, it shouldn't be that way. People need to be educated on this and uh, there shouldn't be this stigma about talking about it before it happens or after it happens. You're thinking of this in high school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I've also always been like a, a morbid weirdo. Like I, when I was uh, like three or four, we were driving past the funeral home in my hometown and it was my mom and my brothers were in the car and I said, I'm gonna live there someday. And I didn't know it was, a fu it was a funeral home. It was just a big Victorian, beautiful Victorian home. And they laughed at me and always made fun of me for saying that. Uh, but it was kind of like, you know, an omen. But, um, and I used to like hang my doll my Barbie dolls by their bunk my brother's bunk beds and my parents thought I was gonna be a murderer. <laughs> anyway, so when I decided I wanted to be a funeral director, everyone was like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so I went to mortuary school when I was 18. I moved from, from Johnsonburg, St. Mary's area to Pittsburgh, like fresh out of high school and went to mortuary school and I loved it. Um, it was like kind of, I had, I, I've, I've always felt very lucky that I knew what I wanted to do in high school and did it and I'm still doing it because I think that that's very rare for kind of young people to, to know what they want to do and do it. And there's really no relationship between the soup and the funeral direction. The relationship is that I, I have always been a natural nurturer and I like to care for people. Um, so that's, that's the relationship in my eyes, that I, I like helping people and feeding people, you know, caring for people in any way that I can. But both, both businesses involve a lot of yeah. work. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and you know, you're doing a lot. Yeah, yeah. And you have to know how to process both of these things. Definitely. And you still love them both. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, I, I'd love them both in very different ways. Uh, the funeral home is very, very rewarding, um, but also very emotionally taxing. And as I get older, it, it affects me more and makes me sad. Um, the soup business is physically taxing, but it never makes me sad. <laughs> huh. And I, actually, I, I, I know in preparation for this, I read uh, what Damon Young wrote about you in the Washington Post. I know, wasn't Post. that so nice? It is, but he talks about the fact that soup is love. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that whole, our, our family connections, all of that seems to blend together. Yeah, definitely. Um, so... Uh, I, I, still don't, I don't want you to stop either one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I will. Even if I, if I end up stepping away from the funeral home to put more energy into the soup business, I'll still be involved in that, in that industry in some way. I'm, I'm never going to um, let my funeral director license lapse. Is there a dream that you would like to have happen? I mean, do you want a soup place? That would be I, your don't, I don't, I don't want a brick and mortar. That just, uh, I don't. I'm not like a, a naturally anxious person, but it's, see, if I had a brick and mortar business, I would just be worried about it all the time. It seems like just so, so much stress to me. <laughs> and I've never really wanted to own my own business. Um, I, I guess my dream for Brothmonger would be to do wholesale and have it in like a location in every neighborhood, like South Hills, East End, but, but you don't have any real desire to like have somebody can your soup or something oh, like that. Oh no, no, no. No, I really uh, the one of the the more important things about it now and going forward is that I maintain control of the product. I don't I don't want it to get so big that I have to have two or three people doing it. Um, I would be okay with with one other person doing it, but it would have to be a person that I could control. <laughs> and do you have rules like this has to be done this way. I have to make my own broth. I have to, you know, make my own meatballs or pasta. Or how, do you have rules like that? Yeah, I I won't really. Um, I do. I I make my own broth as often as I can. Um, I I am fine with using like uh, like chicken paste or something like that. You know, whatever will make the soup taste good, I'm fine with. But I won't use. I would never use frozen meatballs. Um, I I would never use like rotisserie chicken. Um, so you cook all of that yourself? Yes. And then you make this, the like chicken broth from scratch? Yeah. And is there some secret that you have that makes it taste the way you want it to? I just, I use all chicken wings. Sometimes I use 
Most of the time when I make chicken broth, I get like 10 chickens, whole chickens. And I cut the wings off and I cut the backbone out. And that's what I use for the broth. And I let it go until, pretty much until it like turns yellow. <laughs> like until uh, I can see fat in it. Um, and it's, it's reduced a bit. But yeah, I think that the, like the cartilage and fat content in the, the chicken wings and, and the backbone are what make the chicken broth good to me, I think. No, it's funny. I, my memories of soup often involve my grandmother, my father's mother, and uh, she was famous for her chicken noodle soup, but I, I always hated those little bubbles of fat on top. Oh, no, that's the good stuff. <laughs> that's what I realize yeah. now. But I think as, as we grow older, our tastes change. I would love to now taste my grandmother's yeah, I chicken bet. noodle soup. So one of my customers, uh, she ordered a small batch of chicken soup for me and said to me, like, don't worry, I... I will skim the fat off of it. And I said, don't do that. I was like, don't do that. <laughs> Just heat it up and eat that part. And she was like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you have a favorite kind of soup to make? Um, I, not really. I, I have less favorite kinds of soup to make um, that, I, that I don't really enjoy making, but uh, I don't really have like a favorite kind to make. I have favorite kinds to eat but um yeah they they kind of all i kind of enjoy all of it all right and uh, what about like spices do you like to make it spicier i find that in general i think when you make f something for a lot of people it has to be sort of safe yeah and then i, I do I, I really enjoy making uh making things spicier but then i have to be very like uh forthright with the, the spiciness just like and just, just so you people. know yeah just so you know this is going to be spicy maybe it will be spicier than you can handle but um i don't i don't shy away from doing that and you don't mind that uh, like i i love trinidad scorpion salt from the pittsburgh yeah uh, from the steel city salt company yeah i often shake that on just to like no, the, yeah it. that doesn't i don't mind that at all um and another thing that i've always loved about getting soup from you was there's often accoutrements that mm -hmm. come with it you know there's yeah. uh you know uh crackers herbs herbs yes yeah. parsley uh oyster crackers with the clam chowder yeah i always think that's it just makes them more special because you know when you buy a can of soup you don't get any right to put on top yeah i think that um a, a large part of soup that maybe sometimes uh gets overlooked is the fact that toppings or, or whatever make it better and fun to eat. Um, I usually try to tell people to put olive oil or red pepper flakes or parsley or, you know, uh, Parmesan cheese or something like that. If I'm not including it, like this is what you should eat it with. Um, but I really like giving those things to people and, and forcing them to eat it the way that I want it to be served. Right, and so you, 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 and you still do that like with the time machine where you now distribute, you sometimes give little extras for on top. Yeah, I did, I, I did oyster, I definitely always do oyster crackers for, uh, for clam chowder or crab bisque. Um, Cause I, I make seasoned oyster crackers, but um, which I think you've had. Yes, and so you actually add the seasoning yeah, and make then those. rebake them? Yes. You, you, uh, do a second generation yeah, yeah. of oyster crackers. Yes, um, but yeah, I try to I try to um, include toppings as much as I can. Sometimes it's just not possible with the amount of work that I have to do. I don't have time to to kind of parse out those things. But all right, um, can we talk quantity for just a little bit about like how much soup do you make at one time? I mean, you know, how many quarts do you get out of a batch now? Um, out of a batch, I I probably get like 40 quarts per f flavor of soup. Um, but sometimes I'll do like a double batch, uh, f like for a pop-up, I, I usually try to make between 150 and 200 quarts of soup. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And so, and now you do that at Time Machine. Yes. Which is like a commercial kitchen. Yes. Although it's sort of right out in the open, it always has been there, I think. Right. It's, it's, I don't, I don't really know what defi defines a commercial kitchen, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a production kitchen. He runs his business out of there and I, uh, I have kind of, um, gotten into a groove there and it's, it's easy to, 
to work out of there. So it's working out well. And uh, is there a time during the week when you do that? Like on Wednesdays, I do this or something like that to get ready for the weekend. It seems to be a weekend thing. Yeah, he's open Thursday through Sunday. So last week I made soup on Wednesday um, and then had it ready for Friday so that he didn't have to deal with it on his first day. <laughs> um, but so this, so I'm probably going to end up doing it like Tuesday or Wednesday uh, for it to be ready on Thursday because he's, because he's open um, Thursday to, to Sunday. He's usually not in the restaurant Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and how does the funeral business affect that? Because I think the funeral business, you can't always predict when you're going to need to be there. Yeah. Um, Luckily, my, my schedule at the funeral home is pretty lenient these days. I've been in the industry for uh, 14 years, so I, I feel like I've put in my dues to now where I can have kind of a better schedule. Uh, so I usually end up only being on call like less than 10 nights a month. Um, I don't really have to work nights a lot, so I now it's a little easier for me to kind of plan my nights and, and plan my schedule. Uh, but yeah, sometimes if, if someone dies, there's nothing I can do about that. And then I just have to drop everything to handle uh, the more important task. And, and can you tell us where you do this work? The, where, the at funeral? the funeral home? I work at Lachlan Funeral Home in Mount Lebanon. Um, it's right on Washington Road. Uh, and I've been there since 2017. Wow, that's a while. Yeah. Okay. Before that, I worked at Fry Bogles for five years. Huh. It's funny, I, I grew up knowing the Hennies. I don't know if you're Henny Funeral Homes. Yeah. There's two of them now yes. in Bethel Park. So uh, Paul Henny owns my funeral home. Oh. And you are familiar with Dave, his brother. I'm familiar with both of them because yeah. we grew up, our, our fathers hunted and fished oh, together. Oh, isn't that funny? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Paul, the Paul Henny Funeral Home on Library Road is, uh, that's, that's his funeral home. And then he also owns the funeral home that I, so he's my big boss. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's Pittsburgh. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody knows everybody. Yes. Um, yes. No. Uh, and uh, I, I, I knew those guys, but then Susan, their sister, was my age. Oh, okay. Um, in, in school, I knew her first, bef you know, but then when my dad and our dad started hunting and stuff together, yeah. it, it was, you know. So you grew up in the South Hills and then left and came back. I was gone for 16 years. Okay. Yes. Mostly in the South. Mostly in North Carolina and South Carolina. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I do have some of your clam chowder. Okay. I just thought we'd have some. Okay. Let's do it. All right. So actually, I didn't plan this. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> no. It's just, I thought, it oh, I... It seemed very I, planned to me. <laughs> I, but you know, I just called you and said, can you, were, were you Oh, yeah, that's week? true. And, and, that's true. And I had this... You just so happen to have the soup. I just so happen to have this. Because you are a customer. I am a customer <laughs> and a happy customer. I don't, this is the first time this has ever happened to me. Really? Yeah. I mean, someone served you your own soup? <laughs> yeah. But how much fun. I know. Um, and... It smells good. I worry that... Uh, I didn't give you enough clams. So let's, I, let me get some of these goodies. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I do have some of the, your uh, special oyster crackers. And you can shake or pull or, and, uh, you happy? <laughs> yeah, it looks uh, lovely. Is there any rule about how many uh, oyster crackers? No, there's no rule. It's, it's up to you. Um, so, and they add a little spice. Yeah, there's spice on them. And your grandfather's recipe, is that what you said? Yes, my grandpa Jack was a cook in the army and was a really good cook and was the main cook in the household. Uh, my grandma didn't cook, but this is his recipe which um, my Uncle Sean started making after my grandpa got really old, and then my Uncle Sean would never give me the recipe, and I asked him for it all the time, especially after I started Rothmonger, and he would never give it to me. And then after my grandpa died, he gave it to me. Um, and is that the maternal line? So is it your no, mother? No, that's my on my dad's side. So both sides of your family have had an influence on you as a soup maker. Yeah. When you taste it, now what, what do you think is like most distinctive? Do you know? I mean, what, what makes it, uh, 
Sarah or Brothmonger clam chowder? I, I don't know. <laughs> what makes it creamy? Cream. Yeah, cream. There's a roux involved. Sometimes uh, a slurry if it's not creamy enough. I, a slurry. What makes a slurry? Cornstarch and water. Okay, and that makes it a little thicker? Yeah. All right. So um, there are a couple questions that I always like to ask people uh, on this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first is, why do you live in Pittsburgh? So growing up where I grew up. In north central Pennsylvania. Right. Pittsburgh was kind of the closest big city. So when we had to go to a concert or go to a baseball game or shopping, we were coming here. Uh, and it's close enough that it's doable. So I kind of always wanted, my whole life I wanted to move here. And I wanted to go to school here. So it just like really worked out um, when I decided to go to PIMS, the Pittsburgh Institute of Mortuary Science. So I moved here when I was 18, and when I moved here to go to PIMS, my mom was very supportive and helped me a lot, and I didn't know anybody here. I was very much alone. But it was kind of the first time in my life that I felt like that feeling of this is exactly where I should be um, at, this, at this time, and I'm doing the right thing. I had like a very you know, profound like epiphany of like being in the right place at the right time. So I stayed and I started becoming a funeral director. And then at one point, I used to go home every weekend while I was in college. And then at one point I remember thinking like, I, I need to make my life here and I need to stop going home. So I started staying here on the weekends and meeting more and more people. And then after about four or five years, I had this realization that I had like met everyone in, in the city. I was like, I, I started meeting new people, but they weren't really new because they knew everyone that I knew. And I was like, okay, like I've closed the circle. So uh, I know so many people here and I feel very much at home here. And um, I don't really, I haven't lived in any other cities, but I don't really think that Brothmonger would have been able to be as successful anywhere else. Just because I have such a support system here um, already, and then everyone, everyone in the city is just so, so nice and welcoming and supportive. Um, but yeah, I feel it's just, I can't really say like, it's not like any other place because I don't really know what any other place is like. But uh, yeah, it's just wonderful. I love, I love Pittsburgh a lot. And still do. Yes. Okay. And uh, sometimes I, mean, I hate it, but you know, it's just like, that's a natural feeling of knowing something. Right. That's the way life is. Yeah. The whole idea of being here is okay. What do you mean? I mean, you don't mind being in Pittsburgh. No, no. I, yeah, I choose to be here. <laughs> right. Because we call this uh, podcast Gum Bands, mm -hmm. did you know the word Gum Bands when you were a, a kid growing up? Do you know it now? Uh, uh, no, I did. there's a, a number of those Pittsburghese things that I did not know until I lived here and continue to learn. Um, but no, I've never heard of gum bands uh, until I lived here. I know it now, um, and I'm, I'm fond of it. Do you use gum bands at all in Constantly. what you do? Constantly. In yeah. both jobs? Not, no. Well, no, not really. I, I use them pretty rarely at the funeral home, but I use them constantly at Brothmonger and at home. Um, I have, I eat like a lot of uh, produce and you know, that you get like those purple or blue rubber bands. I have a, a little teapot on top of my microwave, which is right next to my prep area, that I always save those and put them on the uh, arm of the teapot. So I have like a little rubber band collection. And I use them constantly for food and uh, closing containers and stuff like that. All right. And um, I always like to ask people about family history. Mm -hmm. Um, I know this weird story about my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother, I'm sorry, uh, who came from Ireland. Um, she stole her sister's money in order to come to America. <laughs> <laughs> but we loved that story as a kid. Yeah. And so I always like to, is there a story in your ancestral history that you've always liked that 
you know, could be uh, not necessarily great, but fun and... Yeah, well, I, I have probably 10 uh, stories that are not appropriate uh, for the general public. And I talk, it's funny because I called my mom and talked to her about this this morning and she kept being like, well, you could, no, don't say that. But um, I want to talk a little bit about my grandmother, my great grandmother. Uh, her name was Bertha, Grandma Bert. She uh, lived to be 98. And when she was, up until she was 92, she was driving and in a bowl, a weekly bowling league. Um, and she was just an amazing woman. And I was very lucky to have her in my life until I was 18. Um, and then after she was uh, at like 93 or 95, she lived by herself as well. And then she had a stroke and ended up going into a nursing home. But um, she spoke German and she was just really cool. She had a full head of hair, but she always wore a wig my whole life. Um, but after she died, my mom and my brothers and I actually moved into her house. And when we were cleaning out her house, she had all over the house railroad spikes. So it would be like three railroad spikes tied together with a piece of like ripped lace. And it was so that she could beat up an intruder with them. There was like one next to the front door, one next to the back door, one in the bedroom, one in the bathroom. It was so, it was so weird. We were like, what, what is going on? She also had, she had like a lot of gaudy stuff and she would always, for the last like 10 years of her life, if you went to her house, she would try to give you her stuff. So I have all of her china now. I have a set of Tiffany lamps that were hers. Um, but she was just like a really, a really cool lady. And her father um, actually came here from Austria, but he was a logger and he cut, he, a tree fell on him and he cut his own leg off. So he uh, had an amputated leg, like right above the knee. He lived. He, so then he just only had one leg. Wow, good story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you did say that both sides of the family were big. Yeah, um, I don't really, I don't really have any uh, inappropriate or weird stories about my dad's side of the family. Um, Which is Macaulay? Macaulay, yeah. And, and, and is that Irish or yes, Scottish? Yes, it's Irish. Um, so my mom's side of the family is Italian and German. My dad's side of the family is Irish. Um, but I actually, that's my, my uh, biological father. My last name actually was recently changed to Coppolo not to like get into this whole other aspect of my life, but my mom's husband, my stepdad, who's been in my life since I was 13, actually adopted me last year. So now my last name is not Tassone or Macaulay. It's supposed to be Coppolo. I just haven't gotten into the whole like rigmarole of actually changing it. How nice. Yeah, lovely. You actually met him last time you uh, came to Time Machine. Oh yes, okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. And he's Italian, obviously. Well, um, I, I feel like every time I see you or meet you, I, I learn things. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, I uh, feel the same way about you. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, and here we are with, with, with delicious clam chowder. And, uh, and I thank you for being part of Gum Bands. Yeah. I Thank you so much. I was overjoyed when you asked me to come on. And I, it's, it's been a blast, as usual. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Hey, it was really great talking to Sarah, but you know, nothing is forever. And shortly after we did this interview, in her newsletter called The Broth Mailer, she revealed that she decided to become a full-time soup maker and she quit her job as a funeral director. Also know that she's selling her soups now, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, out of the business called Time Machine on Liberty Avenue in Bloomfield. You might want to try them. This Gum Bands podcast is made possible by the Buell Foundation, serving southwestern Pennsylvania since 1927, and by listeners like you. Thank you.